from 1976 to 1981, he rode at UCLA, winning three varsity letters until a back injury stopped his career. He then coached UCLA from 1983 to 1985 and was a coaching assistant to Thar Neeson, the Italian National Technical Director in Italy from 1986 to 1988. Matt is also chair of the IPC International Para Paralympic Committee, a Paralympic Games Commission, and has been a member of the IOC Sports and Environment as well as Development Commission. He's been a speaker on marketing, television, and event organization issues at international seminars, including sports accord conventions, IF forums, and at Sport Cal Media Rights Seminars. He is an invited lecturer at sports management master's programs in Luzon, Amsterdam, Newcastle, Oslo, London, and Neuchâtel, as well as sports leadership programs for USOC and UK sports. Matt lives in Luzon, Switzerland with his wife, Amber, and their four children. I'd like to welcome Matt, and I'd like to thank him very much for being here with us. Thank you very much. I hope you'll be able to hear me until the end of the evening. Caught a cold on the flight over. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm sorry that it's my first appearance for a long time. Um, you guys set the bad weekend. First weekend of March, I have a, uh, a big meeting every year. So it's the first time I've seen some of these guys in 35 years. I had to ask some of them their names. <laughs> I'd like to thank Richard Gear, uh, Richard Mayer for. <laughs> yeah, a nice dinner last night, and he won the best hair award of the 1980 and 81 team. So uh, I got a message from my coach, and I would like to acknowledge my coaches, Norm Witt, who was my freshman coach. Dewey Hecht, who was my first year of varsity coach, and Bob Newman, who did my last two years at UCLA. Thank you. I, uh, I missed out on 1979 because I herniated a disc in my back, and so uh, I came back in 80 and 81, and, then, uh, and I tried to row a little bit longer with Mr. Kovac over there, in a pair, but uh, my back didn't uh, hang in there. Um, and then I started coaching the lightweights with uh, Kevin Sherwood. Where are you? In the back. And part of, part of my story is that I, uh, there was no coaching education in the States at that time. And I felt uh, pretty limited to you know, train these guys without having any background in coaching. So part of my journey was to try to learn more about coaching. And uh, so in 1985, uh, um, in the beginning of 1986, I moved to Italy to the Italian National Training Center on a small lake at Piedi Luco. Um, and I had to learn Italian. And uh, I spent three years there with uh, Tor Nielsen, who uh, was considered the best coach in the world. Um, and I was fortunate. I went up to him and I said, I'd like to, to work for you. He said, okay, what's your name? And uh, he said, do you know something about computers? I said, oh, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, yeah, I think so. But I said, I have to do one more year of my MBA and then I can come. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's stay in touch. Yeah, okay. Went silent. <clears throat> anyway, it worked out. And uh, for my first time, my first time ever in Europe, I moved to Italy, to a town of uh, 60 on top of a mountain in Umbria. And if you know uh, the corner of Wilshire and Westwood, I lived there one year before they tore down my apartment and put up a skyscraper. So I went from the busiest intersection in the world to Umbria, where if you heard a bird cheep, you know, you would start complaining about all the noise. <laughs> so I, uh, I had a, a really nice run uh, for 
three years there. You know, I uh, coached world champions, or I helped, I was part of the team, coaching team of fantastic athletes from all over the world. Um, learned a ton. Um, learned that I probably shouldn't stay a coach. And uh, was able to, you know, move my management background, business background into sports management. Um, I went back to the States for three years in 1989 to a place called uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, which was um, a more foreign country for me than uh, Italy. <laughs> anyway, I did three years there, and then I was uh, fortunate. I did a lot of volunteering for FISA, um, and I was fortunate to get a job as development director, which was development in the sense of sport development. And uh, you'll see something about that. And I did that for four years. Um, and then was uh, fortunate to become executive director in 1995. And if you're counting, it's 21 years, the same job. So uh, I'm a dinosaur in, the, in Lausanne among the sports federations because they're usually changing the executive directors uh, every couple of years. Um, and it's been a great, great pleasure and a great honor. So what are you going to talk about, Matt? Okay, what, what can I tell these people? So, uh, I decided to give you a little update on international rowing and some stories about Olympic Games and different things, and then we'll go into some more stories at the end. So, uh, first we need a Bruin moment, yeah. which yeah, was one of the nicest moments of my life, I must say, um, that moment right there. Um, and thanks, Bob, and thanks, guys, uh, for sharing that moment with me. We hated those guys for so many years. Um, it was really good to get them. So, um, what seat are you in, Matt? I'm in the two seat. Bob needed some guy to keep the starboard guys in the board. So he put me up in the bow. I, you know, I considered it a demotion after being six the year before, but you know, Bob made it happen. So I got to look at John Nelson's back and listen to Joe. Anyway, if I could have the next slide. Uh, seriously, uh, my journey uh, has a lot to do with this man, um, and I want to really uh, make sure all you young guys know uh, what an outstanding person we had on our side named Julian Wolf. Yeah. And, you know, you you probably know what he did for UCLA. But I can tell you, for U.S. rowing and for international rowing, um, he did a fantastic job. And I want to tell you one story. In 1983, um, we had to select the next Olympic coach for the U.S. And you know, up until 83, it was always a, a famous college coach who kind of part-time coached the national team, when, but his, you know, his college was always first. And um, Julian had the courage uh, and, and took the step to hire the first full-time professional U.S. national team coach, Chris Korzenowski. And I think, for those who know, everything changed. And it was, I, I, I really, I was at that meeting, and it was a very uh, emotional moment, because we, the committee didn't select Harry Parker, which was the obvious choice. Chris changed everything. Chris had been in Petey Luco and came over and then a little bit later I went. And so anyway, we have a connection there. But I would just like to thank, acknowledge, sorry, can you go back, uh, Julian for his constant positivity and his constant row of bad jokes. <laughs> and Mary had a lot to do with his bad jokes, so Mary, thank you for that. <laughs> so Julian Wolf. explain to you uh, what a FISA is, because I'm not sure everyone knows. Um, we, uh, rowing, had the first international sport federation, 1892. It was formed in Turin, Italy, and uh, we can be really proud of that. We were the first ones to get organized. Um, it is, um, in that time, um, nation states were still being formed, so they were societies of rowing. And the, the five members of FISA were Italy, 
France, Switzerland, Belgium, and a place called Adriatica, which is uh, the eastern, northeastern part of Italy, which was uh, occupied by the Austrians in that time. And that's a quiz in the umpire's exam that you have to know that factoid. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at some umpires around here. Jean, Sheila. So, um, so it was the International Federation of Rowing Societies, okay? Um, and the interesting thing is the reason it was formed back then, those reasons are still valid today. There were no internationally accepted rules of racing, so each time you went to a different country, it was totally different rules, and the home team you know, had a huge advantage. The boats were not um, standardized, so you'd go to a, you know, a different place, and uh, you'd have to row in their boats because we didn't have freeways and, you know, got our tunnels and all that in those days. So you had to use the boat that you found there, which was totally different. Um, there was some, you know, the race course was out and back, around the pole or a triangle. Or, and so it was, you, you, the home team had all the advantages. So the reason, one of the reasons they formed is to, you know, standardize the approach to racing and to the sport. And they also had some issues with betting and prize money which I don't know if you've heard about uh, tennis and some uh, other sports, it's a continual issue. And you know, rowing nearly died uh, at the end of the 1800s due to betting and, and match fixing and manipulation of competition. So we really try to keep betting out of our sport. Um, we've been in the Olympic Games since the beginning of the modern Olympic era in 1896. Unfortunately, on that day in Athens, um, it was blowing too hard and rowing had to be cancelled. Um, in those days, uh, a sport had one day. So um, rowing, the day of rowing was bad weather in Piraeus Harbor in Athens. But there's some really good stories of rowers that went on to win gold medals in other sports. Wow. And there were some, the Danish four got gold medals in, I don't know, shooting or something like this. But they went there for, for rowing. So anyway, and we are the third largest sport of, in the Olympic Games, 550 athletes and 14 medal events. So we can be very proud of that. So this is the proof that uh, we were on the program in Athens in 1896, so if anyone ever questions that. Um, okay, next please. Um, just to make sure we're all on the right map here, that is where Switzerland is. <laughs> next please. That is Lake Geneva, and that's where Lausanne is. Okay, next please. That's Lausanne, and the IOC headquarters is over on, the, on your left. Uh, FISA is down near the lake. The rowing clubs, there are two rowing clubs in Lausanne, and my apartment's just up the street from the FISA. So, next one, please. We are in the House of Sport, Maison de Sport International, with 16 other international sport federations. This building was built completed in 2006, so it's been 10 years now, and it had been the dream to combine the sport federation, or to give the sport federations a common platform to be together, and it's been great, because uh, we started a, a lunch of all the executive directors of all the international sport federations, so we could, you know, share knowledge, you know, not repeat mistakes, and, and complain about the IOC and whatever, and so it's been great. And we also have uh, the WADA, the Internet, the World Anti-Doping Agency office in the building, um, and a lot of other, you know, uh, organizations connected to sport. And we're in the building C, which is the third one from the right, on the top floor. We have canoe downstairs, two floors down, so we keep them under control. <laughs> Next, please. Um, one of uh, the big issues for our sport was universality. We need to be a, a strong part of the Olympic movement. We needed to have uh, the sport around the world. And uh, so one of the things I did in Italy with Tor Nielsen was to start the development program. And we wrote, uh, I helped him write on the original compact computer with that little green screen. Do you remember that? <laughs> we, we wrote the coaching manuals, the FISA coaching manuals, which were used by a ton of other federations. But in, uh, I started in 92 uh, as development director to try to develop, and I went around in Asia and Africa and everywhere trying to get people to do rowing and, and bring people together and try to find the crazy guy who would start a club and 
try to get people going. And so we're now at 148. And that's, uh, we're proud of that. Most of them row. We had 101 attempt to qualify for the Olympic Games uh, in London. And we think we're going to have 120 this time. Wow. It's, it's one, of the, one of the statistics that they're checking if we're good boys and girls against all the other federations. And we, we give it a really high priority. Uh, we have, a, in March, uh, the continental qualification regatta of Latin America. And in April, uh, Asia. And then the final one in Lutzer in May. So keep your eye on that stat. We're, we're hoping to get at least, okay, more than 110. Next, please. Um, you've heard a lot probably about anti-doping lately. And uh, I wanted to just share some factoids with you about how rowing has been uh, always a leader in the fight against doping. Can you just tap the button once again? So if you look at the Olympic Games, Let's look at the results. And uh, okay, some of you in this room might remember 1964. Uh, and a good mix of results. Okay, can we have another one? 1968. Oh, GDR. Who can? You young guys don't know what that means. But East Germany was the German Democratic Republic. Okay. In 1966, up until 1966, the Germans had an inter. A competition to select a crew which would represent Germany. But in 1966, uh, the IOC recognized East Germany and West Germany, okay? And it was the NASA for East Germany to show how fantastic they were. So two gold medals. Could we have the next slide? Uh -huh. 1972, three. A little country of about 10 million people in three Olympic gold medals. Could we have the next so, hmm, something is very extraordinary about this country. Next, so um, I'm pleased to say FISA was the first international federation to do out of competition testing. And it was voluntary, um, and the East Germans didn't like it. And they, they came up, and I can show you some letters that were written, and, but uh, one of the first, we were the first. We were the first to have a mandatory life ban for the first offense of anti-doping, and that went until 2003, when we uh, adopted the World Anti-Doping Code, which applied a similar standard for all sports, which was two years on the first offense and life on the second offense. Um, in 2007, we were the first to use DNA analysis to identify anti-doping violations, uh, and that was me against Russians. And uh, I had to keep a low profile uh, for a while after that. But we threw out the Russian Federation. We threw out three boats that had qualified for the Olympic Games in Beijing uh, because they had infused um, nutritional supplements, creatine and things like this. And you're not allowed to infuse non-medicine. So we got them. And they were, it was a long story, but that will be another time. <laughs> and in uh, 2011, we were the first to have a, a rule of no needles at our events. If you're going to use a needle, you have to ask permission, and it has to have medical justification. So, just, we've been, we've been really diligent on uh, anti-doping, and if you hear some other federations that haven't been, you can say rowing is diligent. Okay. And if you were, some of you weren't born yet, but in 1998, the Tour de France had the Festina scandal where uh, the French authorities caught uh, substances in the boot of the, no, sorry, the trunk of the car driving the Festina team. And uh, it caused the creation of the World Anti-Doping Code and the World Anti-Doping Agency. So in 2000, we had a big jump in tests, um, and that's continued. And so this is a little factoid about the number of tests that happen in the sport of rowing all around the world. <coughs> Next. Okay, FISA and the Olympic movement. You might know that uh, Baron uh, Pierre de Coubertin was the founder of the modern Olympic movement, and he's kind of, you know, the Mao Little Red Book. He, he's the, the guy who started it, and he had a big uh, respect for rowing. Um, and he moved the IOC to Lausanne, 
Um, and rode regularly uh, in Ushi, where right by where you saw the arrow and the rowing clubs, um, and, and, and wrote a lot about the benefits of rowing and the connection to education. Next, please. Um, in the Olympic movement, we are a part of the Olympic movement. The Olympic movement means the International Olympic Committee, those guys who decide where the Olympic Games will be held. The National Olympic Committees, each country has a National Olympic Committee, like USOC, uh, 205 of them, and then the International Sport Federations. There are 35, 28 in the Summer Games and 7 in the Winter Games. Next. And the Olympic movement, of course, is made up of broadcasters and sponsors and media, and, and I would have put the world's best athletes down, down at the tip of the pyramid, but anyway. Um, but that's, we're a part of the Olympic movement, which is a fan, amazing phenomena of our time. You know, it's the one event that gathers the world every two years, every four years for the Summer Games. And we are just living in a golden era. And uh, you should really think about that because it's amazing what we're experiencing. Uh, but it's under a lot of pressures right now. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Next. So, in the Olympic movement, the International Sport Federations, am I getting too long? Okay. International Sport Federations are supposed to organize their sport, make the rules for their sport, and we organize the uh, event at the Olympic Games. So, um, we spend a lot of time preparing the event and staging the event at the Olympic Games each year, each four years. So, just among other things. Next. Um, like I said, there are 28 sports in the Olympic Games for Rio. There were 26 for London because they threw out baseball and softball. But uh, we will be joined for the first time by golf and rugby sevens in Rio. So we'll make 28. And these are the 28 that share the Olympic television rights revenues. So we keep a close eye on how we're doing against the other sports. Next. <coughs> 